Welcome to the Danville Museum of Fine Arts and History. I am Carice Luck Brimmer and I'll be taking you through the civil rights exhibit titled The Movement. What we're about to see is some interesting stories, inspiring protesters, and some of the overall pictures that you would have seen from 1963. The civil rights movement in, didn't just happen in Danville, but it happened nationwide. And we're about to take you on Danville's personal story and personal struggle through the civil rights exhibit. When you first enter this exhibit, the first thing you're gonna see is the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. These, after the Civil War, were known as the Civil Rights Amendments. This freed slaves, this gave everybody equal rights, or so we thought. And it helped start a movement that they didn't even know they were a part of a movement yet. So in Danville, the movement actually started in April of 1960, 95 years after the surrender at Appomattox. On February 1st, 1960, one of the most famous sit-ins happened in the world, in my opinion. In Greensboro, North Carolina, African-American students came into a Woolworths, which was like a grocery store, diner, like a five and dime store back in the 60s. And what they did, they actually sat down and they were going to order food. But the thing about that is, in the 60s, African Americans were not treated as fairly as whites in the area. They had to be served in completely different. So this was a major stand against the injustice that started a movement called the Civil Rights Movement. Just a few months later, on April 2nd of 1960, the very building that we're in hosted a sit-in. And in 1960, Robert Williams and Chalmers Mebbin and a few other students from the all-black Langston High School, um, they would go to the William F. Grasty Library on Hallbrook Street, which was the all-black library. And they became frustrated with their library because Right up the street from them was the Danville Public Library. And in that library, the books were up to date and they could get the things that they need um, to do the proper research um, for book reports and things that were due. And so they would go to the William F. Grasty Library and they wouldn't have the things that they need. Many of the books were outdated, um, they were torn, a lot of them were old. Um, Dick and Jane readers from like a hundred years ago. I mean, these are the things that they had to work with. So they got together one day and they decided, we're going to stage a sit-in at the Danville Public Library, which at the time was segregated. They did not cause any ruckus. There was no violence that day. But when they were discovered, they were asked to leave. They said no. And what happened that day would change the course of Danville history forever. One of the major families that was responsible for this sit-in was the Williams family. Robert Williams behind me was one of the students that actually came in and sat in here at the library. One of the pages at this library was Reverend Thurman Eccles. And if that name rings a bell, he was one of the first people arrested in 1963 during the march in Danville. A lot of history is happening in Danville and not many people knew it at this time. It wasn't until August of 1960 that a federal judge ordered all libraries to reopen. The Danville Civil Rights Movement didn't just start in 1960. There was probably planning before that. But in these panels, it shows the discussions that everybody was having, from preachers to teachers to just ordinary citizens that wanted to make a change. One of the most famous quotes said right here in this city was actually Martin Luther King's second most famous quote, and that is, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Wherever injustice is alive, it is a responsibility for people of goodwill to take a stand against it, for injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And as long as this community has problems, as long as the Negro is not free in Danville, Virginia, the Negro is not free 
anywhere in the United States of America. And I come here to say to you that I am concerned about the injustice in this community. And in the city of Danville, that could not have proved more true. The police brutality here was so bad that Martin Luther King was quoted as saying Danville had one of the most brutal police forces he had ever seen. We have certainly been with you in spirit, and we have agonized with you as you have faced the brutality and the ruthlessness of a vicious police force. I've seen some brutal things on the part of policemen all across the South in our struggle, but very seldom if ever have I heard of a police force being as brutal and vicious as the police force here in Danville, Virginia. And you have stood up amid this with great courage. You have done it with great discipline and great dignity. And I want to commend you for it. The one goal that Martin Luther King had was to join everybody together in nonviolent protest. And we're about to show you some of the nonviolent protests that happened here in the city of Danville. If you look at this photograph above, you'll see people protesting through the streets. Not only was June 10th very important for the civil rights movement, but it's a day that probably a lot of protesters will never forget. On that day, not only were protesters beaten by police, fire hoses out, and the full brigade of policemen out on the streets, but that was the day that Lawrence Campbell will probably never forget. His wife was actually beat by the chief of police on that day. And as you can see in this picture, it actually shows Lawrence Campbell walking through the streets, and his protest sign is not a very pretty one. And the protest sign reads, Chief McCain beat my wife. These protest signs were not meant to cause outrage or anything. It was meant to help people see what was going on. Let's say you wanted to get something out to the public today. What would we do? We would probably tweet it, put it on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, all of these social media platforms we use, we use today to get a cause out and help cause change. Well, in 63, they didn't have any of that. The news media was very hush-hush in the city of Danville because of the city council at the time. The police chief at the time, Chief McCain, he came out there and he told the press, he actually, he took Dr. Zellner's camera, he took it from around his neck and he threw it to the ground and he stomped it. And he looked at the members of the press and he said, this is going to happen to you, what I did to this camera, if you take any pictures. So, if you notice, the story of Bloody Monday, it picks up in the register and B days after. The register and B doesn't even report on Bloody Monday, but this went all over the world. This made national news. There was a lot of massive protests that were happening throughout the city, and one of the biggest one was the march through the streets into the city municipal building. They were known to march around the municipal building and actually stand around the statue of Harry Wooding, who was Danville's longest running mayor and actually a soldier during the Civil War. The reason they marched up and down the steps is because they wanted to show that they were not alone. There was thousands of people that showed up that day just to march up them steps and around. While they were marching up, they were singing songs, free at last, free at last, thank God almighty we're free at last, and different civil rights protest songs of that age telling you this would have been an inspiring moment to see in the 60s but can you imagine walking through those streets knowing that you're making history the world is looking at you the world is at full view of what you want to say what you want to get across to the community and Danville showed up that day not only people from Danville showed up but people from nationwide movements showed up to a crowd of over 2,500 people, March 26, 1963, Dr. King spoke here at the Danville City Auditorium. And he said during that speech that Danville had one of the most brutal police forces that he had ever seen. Demonstrations and mass meetings followed. And then on June the 7th, a special grand jury of all white, jurors and one black who was Martin C. Martin, president of First State Bank, they were indicted. 
Um, under the 1859 John Brown statute outlawing conspiracy to incite the colored population of the state to acts of violence in war against the white population. So keep in mind that this is 1963. So they're not only fighting <laughs> against segregation, they're fighting against these old laws. This is 1963, and they indicted them on a law from 1859, and slavery had not even been abolished yet, a law that was over 100 years old. After the members of the DCPA were indicted, the Reverend Hildreth McGee, um, he decided to lead a, a prayer vigil in response to... Um, the grand jury indicting the members of the Danville Christian Progressive Association. So um, the Reverend Hildreth McGee, he leads this prayer vigil in the alley right across from the courthouse. And before he could finish his prayer, they, the police officers, they let the fire hoses loose and the billy clubs. This is a replica of, of a hose that they used back then. Um, the water, the pressure from these hoses, um, the pressure was enough to break your skin. And this, what, these were the billy clubs. Um, a couple of years ago, I talked to a police officer. He wasn't on duty June 10th, but he was on duty June 11th. And he described the billy clubs to me. And he told me that the billy clubs had lead in them. And they also had nails in them. So when they hit you with these billy clubs, not only were you getting knocked out, you were getting poisoned with lead. That day they even deputized just regular men, garbage, um, um, sanitation workers. Um, they deputized them, just regular old people. And these people, by law, they could beat you. They gave them billy clubs to beat you with. Um, so they could do this legally here in 1963. And um, Hildreth McGee was led off to jail. I'd like to mention this story that my colleague, the late Emma Edmonds, told me. Over 20 years ago, when she was doing her research for the Danville Civil Rights, she interviewed Dr. H.G. McGee, who was the pastor of the Greater Triumph Missionary Baptist Church in Chatham at the time. And he had a billy club that was mounted to the wall in his office. And she asked him, she said, why do you have that up there? And she said he just bowed his head and she, she said, he just looked at her and said, you know, I have that billy club up there to remind me of man's inhumanity to man. I'll never forget. This is a telegram. This is a telegram between Attorney General Robert Kennedy and Dr. Martin Luther King talking about the events of Bloody Monday that happened here June 10th, 1963. And so this just lets you know that this was a national story. It went all over the world. And so Attorney General Robert Kennedy says, I'm appalled at the beastly conduct of law enforcement officers at Danville, Virginia. Have on the scene reports that peaceful demonstrators, men, women, and children were mercifully clubbed with billy sticks, 15 of whom required hospitalization. Late reports last evening charge arrested demonstrators are being taken from sales and brutalized. Request immediate investigation and action to forestall further police violence. I feel that the endurance of the Negro's endurance may be at the breaking point. Very yours truly. And so Dr. King says, a solution that is just and moral. I ask you in the name of decency and Christian brotherhood to creatively grapple with Danville and the nation's most grievous problem. We want you to know that the Southern Christian Leadership Conference is prepared to marshal its total resources and personnel and staff in support of our local affiliate, the Danville Christian Progressive Association. Very yours truly, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. 
When we mention the civil rights movement, there is one hub or central headquarters that everything took place at, and that was High Street Baptist Church. High Street Baptist Church not only held services where different pastors got up and actually tried to inspire the masses to make change in their city, but this was also where they held workshops. High Street Baptist Church was known as a central hub because it was where everybody met. The police knew this too. That's why High Street Baptist Church, across the street from High Street Baptist Church, there were snipers on the roofs trying to intimidate the protesters from going into the church. They knew that this was a very powerful location for the civil rights movement. But once again, no one was scared. They walked in that door and made history. At the Danville Museum of Fine Arts and History, you will learn about protesters such as Dorothy Milner Zellner, who is a student nonviolent coordinating committee staff member. You will learn about protesters like Jerry Williams, who is part of the 1960 student protest. You will learn about Thurman Eccles, who was one of the first people arrested on June 10th at the age of 16. You also learn about Paula Smith, who is the youngest member of the civil rights movement here in Danville. She was escorted off a bus at 10 years old. You will learn about Miss Louise Pinchback. She was known as the Satisfied Demonstrator. She was arrested and she never ever let that smile come off her face. You will learn about James W. Peters Jr., who is the owner of L.H. Brooks Funeral Home during the Civil Rights Movement. A lot of these protesters you will learn stories about and their impact on this area was powerful. Some of them have still stayed in Danville, and you can actually hear some of the stories from them yourselves. This is Apostle Lawrence G. Campbell, and Apostle Campbell is basically known as the father of civil rights here. I could go ahead and quote Reverend Campbell about his famous speech here in the city of Danville, but we're going to leave you with a clip to show you how powerful and how well-spoken this man was during the 1963 movement. And you will see why he was Martin Luther King's right-hand man here in Danville. We will defy, we will defy the injunction. I have been arrested in the city of Danville some five times. I have been to jail before. I'm willing to go to jail again. We will do everything possible to defy the injunction in the city of Danville. I say to you, we will defy, we will defy this injunction. This poem was written by Matthew Jones in 1963, and he was a member of the Freedom Singers um, that were part of the Freedom Riders. And uh, when they came through here, um, he wrote a story based on the events and the things that he saw taking place. And the poem, well, the song, it's a song. It's a freedom song, and it's titled Danville. In Danville on June the 10th, in the year of 63, from Bible Way Church to the courthouse, some people marched to be free. As they fell down on their knees, led by Reverend McGee, he looked up and cried, Lord, please, we want to be free. They heard the voice of Chief McCain as it cut across the prayer. I'll never forget those violent words, nigger, get out of here. And as they heard those brutal words, they didn't turn around. The water from the fire hose knocked them to the ground. And as they fell on the ground, they were hit with billy sticks. I'll never forget that terrible sound as the people's heads did split. Don't you stumble, brother. Don't you falter. Oh, mother, don't you weep. We're climbing up to our freedom although the road is steep. On June 13th, we marched again. They used the tear gas bombs. The grand jury indicted us on $5,000 bonds. In Danville's town, corrupted courts, we got no justice done. We were found guilty before the trial, and the judge, he wore a gun. The movement Danville Civil Rights would not be possible without the board of the museum, without the staff and without the countless volunteers that helped put this exhibit together. But there was one person that it would not be here without. 
the information that we have on the protesters, the pictures that we have of the protesters, and all of this countless hours of work and interviews was made possible by one person, Emma Edmonds. Emma Edmonds was one of the most inspiring people that I ever met, and I know that if she saw this today, she would be extremely proud of what we've done here at the Danville Museum of Fine Arts and History.
to live in the jailhouse like Joshua went to live. 